I mean, you know, seriously, there was, uh, there was a revolution march in 08 in Washington, D.C., and my wife, she uh, went out putting up signs all over Washington. You know, here comes, here, here comes the revolution in Washington, D.C., all right? We're putting up signs everywhere, so a revolution march, you know, where, where do we put them up? Where do we go? Well, Adam Kokesh goes to school there. Adam Kokesh knows he hangs out with my wife that evening, and uh, they're putting him up. She came back to the room, and she goes, you got to hear this guy's speech. You need to read it. You need to see it. And I go, cool. We'll, we'll go to dinner. Next. This is like Wednesday, and the event was Saturday. Humanity marches on. That's it. Humanity. Of course humanity marches on. It always has and always will. But from where and what perspective? He's going to share with us. You know, the, 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 the Zen anarchy. You know, what, what do you have to reject? What do you have to embrace? You know, what part of your humanity, your spirituality, your, your, uh, uh, your uniqueness, your personality, do you get the key? And what do you got to discard? Why? What's the basis? Well, who better to tell us from this generation's perspective on these very important issues that a lot of us just don't have time to even think about? Well, Adam Kokesh has been thinking about it, and he wants to share with you. Adam Kokesh. Ernie, why did you have to remind everybody about the Revolution March speech? Because there was a big problem with that. After you give a speech like that, people expect you to talk like that all the time! And I thought I'd have a little more respect for this audience tonight. And I have to say, I haven't been this nervous giving a speech in a long time. And I'm really honored to have an opportunity to address this audience in particular. And I thought, what was it that I could share that could possibly be of value to you? And I figured, well, if I fuck that up really bad, at least I've got free t-shirts, right? And so there's going to be a chance for anybody who wants to come up and tell me why being a libertarian makes your life better to get a free Adam vs. the Man t-shirt. So I gave this a lot of thought. And you guys get to hear all week from so many different experts, people who have done you know, real research and have academic backgrounds and credibility on certain issues. I'm just a loudmouth. I have no particular area of expertise and I'm flattered that people would listen to me talk about anything whatsoever. But I think in the plat and the, uh, the program for Porkfest, it says that the title of this presentation is War, the Trauma of Statism, and the Path to Liberty. But that's just a placeholder, so we're not going to talk about that. That was something to, uh, you know, and it's funny because I thought, it's really just a placeholder. I have to think of something better. I have to think of something that really honors this audience and the kind of people that are here at Porkfest. By the way, um, I guess by request one more time, this is Porkfest! That's the only reason I grew out the beard. I thought it would get a little more applause than that, no? Damn. <laughs> So I really thought about this, you know, what is it that I can impart to an audience like this that is as enlightened as you are? And I can tell you the story of, of my experience in war. I was in Fallujah in 2004 with the Marines. I was in combat for, uh, for 18 days straight during the, the siege of Fallujah, the first battle of Fallujah in April of 2004. I can tell you all about uh, the, the activism that I've been engaged in as an anti-war activist since then. But um, I'm not an expert on foreign policy. You know, I'm an expert on my experience in Iraq, and there's certainly some lessons to be learned from that. Being really enthusiastic about smoking marijuana doesn't make me an expert about drug policy, but people wanted to hear me speak about that, too. And so I just want to tell you the conclusion. But I have to at least give you a brief summary of how I fell backwards into what I enjoy now as an independent media I, I guess career is certainly too strong a word for it. But the coolest thing I've ever said in a speech is, I make YouTube videos for a living. And it's really an incredible honor to have the support of so many people who believe in my message, who, who share my videos, who believe that what I'm doing is an expression of what they are feeling and what they want to be represented in the national dialogue or in at least into the ether on the interwebs. There are people who like to know that Adam versus the man is out there. So I went to Iraq in 2004. I came home, was, uh, I was a reservist. I went right back to college, was immediately disillusioned with the war. But more importantly, I got in trouble 
for bringing a pistol back my first time. And I didn't, it wasn't a war trophy, I didn't get it off a dead body or steal it from the armory or anything like that. I bought it from a Rocky cop. And it was a souvenir. So I didn't have any, uh, any, any moral qualms about what I did, but I got in trouble for it when I volunteered to go back to Iraq. And the reason I volunteered, and this is really sick, this is one of the, the traumatic things about the military experience that I think touches everybody, and it's always exciting to come to events like this and see that there are a lot of veterans, because the experience of war and of being in the military often propels people away from statism, and it's very exciting to embrace that in a community like this, in a community like Veterans for Ron Paul, when we see so many veterans coming out, speaking out against our current foreign policy. But for me, I, went, I wanted to go back to Iraq because I didn't get a Purple Heart the first time. That's, that's the sick switch that they flip in your brain. That's how it touches everybody. The utmost service to your country is to die for your country. That's not healthy. It's the opposite of even what Patton said. It's not about dying for your country, it's about making the other poor bastard die for his. Well, no, they even fucked that up. So, after that, I, I, I got out of the military and I was just disgruntled enough to start questioning things because I got in trouble, because I spent a year as a sergeant who spoke Arabic with civil affairs experience, willing and ready to go back to Iraq, managing a barracks at Camp Pendleton and mowing lawns. So yeah, I was pretty pissed off. And I say this just because I think it's one of the things that needs to be pointed out and celebrated at Porkfest, especially of all places where we embrace individuality, where the individual is truly celebrated, where we're, I don't want to, I don't want to sound all PC that we're in like a, we're in a judgment-free zone, but as close as you can get to it with the judgments of the market, we have, I think, uh, as close as you can get in our movement to a, a judgment-free zone here at Porkfest. If we don't have a judgment-free zone, there's certainly a lot of people dressed like we do. <laughs> and so after, after that, I was disgruntled. And I was just disgruntled enough to start questioning things. And if I hadn't gotten in trouble, if I had gotten sent back to Iraq, I never would have been put on the course that I'm on today. But it was because I got in trouble. It was because I was a punk. Because I've, I've always been a troublemaker. I've always had a pretty healthy disrespect for authority. But the people that make up this movement, especially the hardcore, the really committed, they're not the people that were going to be student body president or captain of the football team or of the cheerleading squad. We're the misfits. We're the punks. We're the troublemakers. We are the victims of statism. And guess what? There are a lot more of us coming. And that's a very exciting thing. And it's a very important element of our movement to embrace is that a lot of people are here because of the trauma of statism, because of their experiences with government. And there are more and more victims of government every single day. And maybe you as an individual haven't experienced it, but now it seems like everybody knows someone. Everybody's got a family member. Everybody has been touched by this Leviathan. Everybody is a victim on some level. And more people are realizing that waking up to it. But anyways, I ended up running for Congress in 2010 in New Mexico. And the main reason that I'm never going to run for political office again is because of my experience running for Congress in New Mexico. And I, I've, I've been asked a lot if I would run for Congress again, if I'd run for any office. And I said, yes, as soon as we find a constituency where 51% of the voting public will sign a sworn affidavit saying that they'll vote for me before I run, there, I'll vote. I'll run, absolutely, in that situation. But, so after, after running for office, I got a radio show because I was one of those candidates that just couldn't shut up when the race was over. So it seemed like a natural continuation of me running my mouth to get a radio show. And I was supposed to sell ads, and we never did. So right before my radio show was going to get canceled, it got picked up as a TV show by Russia Today. And uh, I was on cable television, enjoyed the bottom rung of the legitimate television ladder for about four months. I like to compare myself to Glenn Beck. He jumped off the top rung of the television ladder, I jumped off the bottom rung. He calls himself a libertarian, I know what that actually means. <laughs> so when my show got cancelled, I decided to 
follow Glenn Beck into the interwebs, and I've got an independent production now, and I do an, I do a more or less daily podcast five days a week, um, more or less by noon, and I do a YouTube channel. I got picked up recently by Maker Studios, which is one of the major YouTube promotional networks. So very excited to be getting that developed and plugged in, but. <clears throat> I want to tell you about what I call, well, Ernie jumped ahead of me and called it Zen Anarchism. I had to use the A word. I'm trying to be fucking PC tonight, Ernie. You really didn't do me any favors here. But I consider the point that I've come to now, the only thing that, that I feel that I've figured out on my own that's valuable enough to share with this audience. And I can only describe it as Zen Libertarianism. Not that I am any expert on philosophy or Zen history or anything like that that would give me any credibility to speak on this topic either, except for the fact that nothing I do is work. I love every second of my life. I absolutely think it is an incredible experience to be alive today as a human being and understanding what it means to be a libertarian. It is an incredible experience that we are enjoying. So right now, before I get into exactly the criteria for achieving Zen Libertarianism. I want to take a minute to give away some t-shirts. My assistant John is in the back there. John, if you'd raise your hand. So I want to go around. I want to give everybody the chance. If you would just raise your hand, if you would be willing to share with us why you think or what it is for you about being a Libertarian that makes your life better. And I guess you're going to have to come up to here because this is the end of the microphone table. Hi, I'm Thor from Last Teleport. I read um, a very nice line from Mensa Smallbrook, who's not a libertarian anymore, but a foreign. But she said that there's a great thing about living in a foreign country is that you trade we government for they government. I don't, you don't have this unrequited love of trade. Oh, we must do this, we must do that. Oh no, we have a jerk in power. Or, oh, oh, okay, we, we, we voted for our guy, but it's too disappointing. There's no more of that. I live in a foreign country. I'm so surrounded by dirty foreigners. All around me! <laughs> dirty libertarian foreigners. <laughs> and, and the libertarian foreigners, indeed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded by all these foreigners who are all stealing all my jobs from me, except the one I have. I have only one left, of all of you. <laughs> and, and I think being a libertarian makes me like... It's like you have all these neuroses for, from birth. You're, 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 you're free from that, and you realize that everyone is free, I'm free, and that's what makes me... Yeah, you say Zen libertarianism, that's exactly that. I feel big weight off my chest. Outstanding. All right, hold on, John. If you would, meet up with John in the back. John, hold up the teacher and show people why they're, why they're doing this. All right. You can stand a little closer. I will. You how close do you want to stand? No, that's perfect. Okay. No, I'm a libertarian because of, uh, or, or an anarchist, really, because of the uh, the inconsistencies with supporting the state and because of my daughter. I've got a daughter that's about a year old and I want her to have something wrapped. Uh, you know, so that's really what drives me and uh, that's the short and sweet Outstanding, thank you. All right. Um, how it makes my life better? Well, for one thing, um, it means that I don't pretend that people who want to throw me in prison or fine me, and I, pre I don't pretend that they're here to help me. I break free of that illusion, and that's, that makes my life a lot better. Outstanding. So you were about Zemmer here earlier, huh? Um, no. Xenarchy is actually related to libertarianism, you know, Sporianism. Yeah, they are. I think they did Xenarchy. I wasn't referring to anything of a term Xenarchy. It was, no, it was just like, I just, Ernie Hancock jumping the gun on me here. Well, it's, it's a cool thing. Um, reason, uh, anarchism. Anarchism is a uh, state of nature. And uh, when we are in our state of nature, we're able to flourish as humans, as individuals, and actually be able to work out with these emerging systems. And it's so great. Outstanding. Next. I'm a libertarian because uh, 
my daughter and her husband combined have done 10 tours in the Middle East for over 10 years. And he is now in Afghanistan and they've got a young child. And when all of this collapses, I'd like to have a structure in place so they can put their lives together. So being a libertarian gives you a sense that we're going to be able to do something better than this? On the other side of this, absolutely, yes. Very much so. Outstanding. Thank you for having motivation for liberty in military service. Libertarianism does not make my life better. I was waiting for this one. I would like to think, I would love to think that we can make the world a better place by using violence and threats of violence against people. I would like to think that we can give people health care, we can give people social care, we can make a more fair and just world if only we could threaten enough people with violence. I'm a libertarian because it's true. You can't use violence to make the world a better place. Go ahead. Well, my name is Will, and uh, full disclosure, I got into politics when I was about 15, and I was a neocon, pretty bad, you know. And when I was into it, it was a very negative thing. You know, I hated, you know, I was a neocon because I fuck Democrats, right? I hated Democrats, I hated liberals, I hated communists, I hated all that. And I think that's kind of motivated me. I love to argue, and it was always from this very negative point of view. And now I discovered liberty through like Milton Friedman and Robert and all that, it became so more positive. So I think it became happier, you know, something that I, you know, enjoy doing a lot more. So that's how libertarians, you know, help me out. Outstanding. Thank you, Adam. Um, in addition to what everyone else said, I always thought that ethics were important and dealing with people honestly and peacefully was how it would lead to our happiness and a, a full life. And I, I realized that at a fairly young age that applying that, that doesn't just apply to oneself, but it applies to politics and it applies to uh, how we deal with each other socially. And it's not right to use force and violence against people privately, and, nor is it uh, public. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, when I was growing up, I was always taught that America was the greatest country in the world. And I really believe that, especially coming from a military family. And as I got older and got more into politics after I met my husband, I learned it's really not the greatest country in the world. And with libertarianism, which I never even heard of until I met my husband, it, feel, it makes me feel like there's still hope that we could be the greatest country in the world again. Or, <laughs> the greatest non-country, perhaps, eventually. Yes. <laughs> Got to know your audience. Thank you very much. All right, and the last one, sir. I think first and foremost, uh, being a libertarian anarchist means never having to say you're sorry about the results of the last election cycle. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually for me personally, it's given me a home. I was a misfit, an outcast, politically. Uh, I'll cut it short. And I've learned economics, and that's what the greatest things have ever happened to me. Outstanding. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Not like Pork Fest, it's nice to take a minute to just appreciate that and enjoy it, but we did have someone come up and say, no. Being a libertarian does not make my life better. So we're not going to dwell on that too much, but I want to acknowledge that because it's very important. That's part of what I want to address in talking about Zen libertarianism and hopefully providing you with something of value with your time here and actually listening to me talk. So, real quick, if you want to just shout them out, what's bad about being a libertarian? Always hungry and angry. You're always angry, that's right. You always have something to be angry about if you're a libertarian. Although it's hard at Porkfest, isn't that nice that you get to set that aside when you're here and stoned for a week straight? Yeah. So anybody- Your family hates you. Your family hates you, that's right. You get ostracized. And, and then your family is more effectively libertarian than you practicing ostracism, right? <laughs> You're still a misfit. Yes, that's right. We are. You're surrounded by idiots. Yes, I hate that about being a libertarian. 
all of a sudden you're surrounded by idiots. So there are a few things that I want you to understand. I want to leave questions for this because this is something that I don't claim any authority on. Like I said, this is an idea that has value to me, what I am able to get out of what I call Zen libertarianism. But there are certain premises that you have to accept, that you have to understand in order to get to this point where you're able to get past all of these things that, that threaten you as a libertarian, that make it harder to be a libertarian. These sort of negative thought patterns that you're tempted to fall into when you see the destructive power of statism, when you see the immorality of it. So the first one, I'm pretty sure everybody here is on board with, liberty is the only moral way for society to be organized. Yes. I think after the incredible lineup of speakers, I really don't have to spend too much time on that premise. But obviously accepting and knowing that what we are advocating is moral, is just, is an absolutely righteous cause because of the values that we give it, because we choose to embrace that moral philosophy and truly apply it universally. You get to, I, some of the uh, members of the audience coming up and sharing what benefits them about being libertarian, it gives you a sense of, of knowledge of your own righteousness. And that's a very comforting thought, and that's very important. If you don't believe in libertarianism, and I use these terms broadly, really, libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, but libertarian being a, a general catch-all term, I suppose, out of respect for the audience, we have to be clear about definitions as well. So, the next one might be a little bit harder and a little more controversial for people here. We're going to get progressively more difficult. The second one that I think you think that I think you have to accept, or at least that I had to accept on my path in order to get to the point of, of Zen libertarianism that I enjoy today, is understanding or believing or choosing to have faith in humanity in such a way that you know somewhere that liberty is inevitable, that humanity marches on, that we are working our way towards a voluntary society. It may be a process of two steps backwards and one step forwards, and I like to see the long view of human history, and that's what gives me confidence in this. But also, I look at technology, and this is something that I talk a lot about on my show, because it's so overwhelming right now, just today, the fact that we all have at our fingertips the wealth of human information that the internet represents. It's like we've got the truth button right there, one click away. And the thing about younger generations, or people that have really adopted this technology as part of their paradigm, so you can lie to us, but you can't get away with it for very long. The way that this has fundamentally changed already what government can get away with, what politicians can get away with. When you look at John McCain in 2008, I guess until I saw Mitt Romney, I thought that he would be the last politician that could go from one event saying one thing to the next day saying something different altogether because YouTube was catching him on it. You would see it, you could splice the videos together. I mean, just that simple empowerment. And now, you know, we've all got the truth buttons right here in our pockets. I know nobody has reception out here, but bear with me here. This, have you appreciated as, as libertarians, as activists, how much this fundamentally changes the conversation? We don't debate facts anymore. You don't have a conversation where you go, oh geez, who was the king of Spain in, in 1633? I can't, I can't. Fuck it, I'll move on and forget about it. No, you look that shit up now. You can figure it out, you can settle bets. You can, right there, you have the authority of the internet in your pocket. And I see that we've gone from the state of nature tribalism, whoever could pick up the biggest rock was in charge when we were evolving from that state of nature as the first primitive humans in roving family units or bands or gangs or tribes or whatever particular evolutionary model that you endorse, it doesn't really matter. But we went from a state where in our nature as pack animals and social organizations, it was advantageous to follow the guy who could pick up the biggest rock. He was the one that was going to get you fed. And if you didn't get along and go along, you wouldn't survive. 
And we've evolved from that to the point where we can realize anarcho-capitalism kind of flies in the face of that original social organization of humans, doesn't it? This ideal of voluntary exchange, perfect mutual self-benefit as seen by the individual actors in the market, and we're able to see that now as an ideal because we've embraced certain moral principles. Because we've realized that we are more productive, we are more prosperous, we are better able to provide for ourselves and for posterity when we're not engaged in war all the time. But it's more than any conscious realization of society, as much as it is a simple progress of evolution on the societal scale. The societies that prosper are the ones that have the freest trade. We're seeing that. We're realizing that. That is the natural course of human progression. And it's only fear being bullied into thinking that statism is necessary in some way or that you can be encouraged to use force in human interactions or, as I describe government now, the manifestation of all of our desires to control and dominate others by force. We're evolving past that because we're realizing that, hey, when you're an emotionally healthy human being, you don't have psychotic tendencies like, you know, running for office. <laughs> So does that make sense to everybody? Freedom is inevitable, at least how I see it. You don't have to agree with me on that one, but I think it's essential to the point that I have come to and the perspective that I enjoy, that I want to share with you. I think it's really important to have that long view of human history. And you know what, even if you disagree, and by the way, I am, I'm a short-term optimist, I mean, excuse me, short-term pessimist, mid-term pessimist, but long-term I'm an optimist. But it doesn't matter, because the sun's going to expand into the earth eventually anyways, and we're all going to die, right? But I think it's advantageous for you as an individual, as a libertarian, to embrace the idea that liberty is inevitable. And I guess the third thing, which I've already covered, is that liberty, the achieving of a voluntary society, is simply a phase of human evolution. Statism is a phase of human evolution. And we are going to get past it simply because we believe in the market, do we not? And we believe that peaceful interactions are superior. They will dominate, they will win. The societies that are able to better embrace these values, as we've already seen throughout history, have been more prosperous. The next thing, and this is where I'm actually going to say something original that you might not have heard from another speaker here this week. You are a wave, not a particle. <laughs> All right! I wasn't sure how that one was going to go over. Do I have to explain the physics, at least, at least briefly here? Yes. You can analyze all matter in the universe as being either made up of particles or waves. And I don't really know shit about physics, so it really doesn't matter. Because when it comes to you as an individual, you know that everything that defines you as a human being is not a matter of physical matter in your body today that in seven years might not, you might not share a single molecule with the body that you had seven years ago. Everything that defines you as a unique human being or as a human being at all is about the wave energy behind your existence, not the particulate matter. So why does that matter to libertarianism? Why should that matter to libertarians? Well, the next the next premise, the fifth thing to accepting Zen libertarianism is the full, willing, open, enthusiastic embracing of the fact that the one thing we all have in common is that we are all going to die. And when you die, you will cease to exist. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on religion, because then we'll be here all night. But religion has only served as a tool for people to get past their inability to accept that. And it's been a tool for exploitation by people who would use it against those who are unable to face up to that. People who would rather say, I'm going to believe this particular mythology of this particular religion or this particular vision of God because it's easier than accepting the scientific reality of human existence.
well, maybe this isn't that exciting of a talk, and you guys already get everything, and none of this is news to you. Do you see where this is going? Do you see how this adds up for me to Zen libertarianism? Because what I get out of this is a complete detachment from any of those negative aspects of what it means to be a libertarian. Any of those things that, any, any of the ills brought to an individual who embraces the truth of statism. All of the frustrations melt away. All of the pain of statism goes away. Because the result of this is a way of embracing self-ownership like never before. When you really acknowledge the true nature just of your physical reality, I mean, how many people do you see going around in the same mythology of statism? Why do they endorse statism? Why do they buy in to the status paradigm? Because it's easier than having the courage that you all have to examine the moral premises of what they're advocating. It's easier to say, oh, we can just use a little force here and get people to go along, and yeah, there's a utilitarian argument, society will be better organized, and we'll take care of poor people better. And it's all escapism. It's all something that serves to detach you from the fundamental truth of human existence that all you ever have is right now. And now. And now. And now. And now. Why am I here? Good question. Why are you here? I mean, Free t-shirts, right? And now. <laughs> so being able to embrace this perspective has allowed me to take on a different attitude towards life. When you think that all you have is the moment, and you can't even experience that effectively, you have to be able to detach yourself from all of these pressures and all of these other stresses and all of this pain that you, ex you are exposed to when you embrace the truth. And I think people know this. I think a lot of libertarians somehow inherently know this. And I would just hope that perhaps my remarks tonight can help you get all the way to the very, very bottom of the rabbit hole. And it's really even arrogant for me, it sounds arrogant for me to, to say it like that, because hell, what the heck do I know about libertarianism? I've only been doing this for a few years. But this is the most valuable thing that I've gained from my experience, that allows me to go about the world every single day with a smile on my face through any experience. And I can tell you, being at Porkfest for a week has really challenged my Zen libertarianism. <laughs> We've had some interesting logistical challenges, but it's reminded me, and it's gotten me more prepared for giving this talk and for sharing something of value. So I hope I've left enough time for questions. I hope that I've imparted something of value to this most esteemed audience good. We've got at least 20 minutes. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Zen libertarianism, I hope it's of value to you. So for questions, if people just want to come up here, since we're not organized enough to have you know, a mic on stage and a separate mic for questions. So that was a couple of years ago. What do you think now, since you're living in the moment now, of your past self having run? What do I think of having run? Well, you know, this is one of the places where I have to say, as a rebellious punk, I am in, in disagreement with some of my philosophical libertarian mentors like uh, Bill Bubert earlier today who spoke, uh, Ernie Hancock of Freedom's Phoenix, and when I was running for, for office I always told people, if Ernie's still supporting me, you know I haven't compromised my principles. And Stefan Molyneux who says that political action is destructive, it's counterproductive, that it endorses the system. I really disagree. I believe in, in two values to politics, and I, I've said that, I said this earlier today on the panel too. I don't, I'm not trying to bullshit you into thinking that you have some obligation to vote as an upright citizen or anything like that, but I think <laughs> using, using the, for, for one thing, using the platform created by government, you know, that gets everybody's attention every couple of years and all of a sudden everybody pays attention to issues that we care about, First of all, taking advantage of that, running, I love the way Ernie Hancock runs for office. He runs and he puts up signs that say, still voting, question <laughs> mark. And I think that political action, not just on that, but I think actually winning office for libertarians eventually is not just a good thing, but a necessary thing. And it's not because it's more important than changing the paradigm, but because when the paradigm changes, there has to be a mechanism provided for it to be manifest in reality, even if it means that it's just 
20 years from now when the free market and, and technology has so taken off and gotten so superfluous in, in, in the innovation. And this is what I wanted to cover earlier about that. Have, do, you guys, do you guys feel now, now that it's summer 2012, can you feel the technology coming on? Can you feel it? It's accelerating. It's getting faster. We're coming to the technological singularity here by 2029 by some estimates. Computers smarter than human brains that we can tell, hey, make the next smarter computer for me. You know, all of these exponential growth curves in human productivity and life expectancy and prosperity are about to hit a vertical asymptote. And that's a really exciting thing. So even when we get to the point where we've rendered government obsolete with the free market, there's still going to be a time we go, hey, can we get a little vote on this? And can we, you know, can we get rid of this thing? Can we cut off this appendage? And even if it comes to that, and it's just an administrative matter of catching the reality up to the paradigm, I think politics is necessary. So how would I look back on myself in my race when I ran for Congress? I don't know. I thought being in the Marines, you know, meant, meant I had a, a pretty pretty high pain tolerance, but no, I think running for office is a great experience. I really, you know, and that's what launched me on, on the, the, the path that I'm on now. Um, it was when I was running for office that I read Ethics of Liberty by Murray Rothbard. That was a, a pretty crucial experience for me. I gotta be honest, I don't read books. I listen to it. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Your mention of the singularity makes this question kind of unimportant. Are you familiar with anyone else in the military who has had the same problem as Michael New? Michael New, the UN. Yes. Michael New got a dishonorable discharge for not wearing a UN uniform. Hey, who cares? We're going to have computers all around us in 20 years. Singularity. We're going to be surrounded by technology and it's going to be real. No, that's a good question. I don't know anybody personally who's had that experience who's refused orders like Michael New, but I think he's a great example. And it's, a, it's, a, it's funny how these really important historical events in, in American political history are so buried, like Major General Smedley Butler coming out writing a book that war is a racket. Even, you know, the, the My Lai Massacre is held up often as a, as a popular example. But all of the little instances of resistance and rebellion, and I know a lot of people that are challenging the military, it's very important for people who are, you know, and so, uh, someone asked me today, hey, I'm on active duty and I'm an anarcho-capitalist, what the fuck should I do? It's <laughs> kind of a scary proposition, and you know you have to, to work your way out of that. So let me just say on that note, if there is anybody who has a family member who's in the military or considering enlisting, uh, help them. <laughs> you know, if you have someone who's in the military who, who doesn't understand this message, there is certainly an opportunity to reach out to them and talk to them about their experience as a enforcer of statism one way or another and so if you want to talk to me about that afterwards please find me I do a lot of independent counseling for people a lot for some reason a lot of people find me for my show and send me emails from people you know from people who are on active duty saying hey what do I do in this situation how do I get out of this how do I deal with this how do I decide how to move forward and it's anything from well, I can get out right now and say that I'm a conscientious objector and that's the right decision for me to, well, I'm going to stay until I get my 20 years because I'm so close to it and I'm going to retire and use all that money against the government to fund my activism for the rest of my life. You know, and unless, there are a lot of people who will say, oh, well, you're an anarcho capitalist, you're in the military, you get it now, you better get the fuck out or you're wrong. And they want to talk to them like a drill instructor. You're wrong. It's a snap point. Private pile. <laughs> Choke yourself. <laughs> so anywhere you know along that spectrum, but unless you're an anarchist saying, "Well, I don't use government roads," you have no business telling someone in the military how to make a practical decision to get out once they've embraced the philosophy. So I, if, if, if people want to do that, do that kind of outreach. You know, please bear that in mind and be respectful of the immediate circumstances that people are in. So I, I had two remarks, or I had one, but maybe it's irrelevant now. Uh, it was, if we want to convince people, we must talk young, because people do not become that emotionally self-destructive like that. They are not like that at birth. They are taught, they are beaten to statism since they are young. If you want to, um, to reach out, we must reach out when they are young. How can we reach out to kids? 
Um, and does it matter? Because you said that the singularity, John McCarthy, uh, one of the inventors of AI, said that a radical optimist is someone who believes that humanity will survive and do well even if it doesn't follow your advice. And uh, so, should we care? And if we do care, how do, how do we reach out to the kids? You should care if it makes you happy to care, first of all. But how do you reach out to kids? First of all, the inevitability of this, part of one of the things that motivates me is simply looking at how child-rearing practices have evolved and developed. And holy shit, we figured out if you don't beat your kids, they don't turn out to be crazy statists. You know? And we made the simple connection, and it's kind of an unquestionable scientific truth now. Yes, the more you beat your kids, the dumber and more psychologically fucked up they're gonna turn out. And if anything, the fact that society today is as receptive to libertarianism as we are as a whole, is because we weren't all beaten by our kids as was almost the norm. And I don't, I'm not an expert on historical parenting trends, but you can go back and, and see that it used to be a common thing. It used to be the accepted norm. This is how you raise human children. You beat them. You beat them into submission because that's the best, you know, when humans are too primitive to understand the free market, to understand voluntarism, that's the best way to survive and reproduce and carry on in the, in the state of nature, going back to that. But because we are seeing that the more we respect our children, and I gotta give a shout out to Stefan Molyneux on this topic because he does incredible work when it comes to explaining why peaceful parenting is so important to achieving liberty. Yes, thank you. So if nothing else, by the fact that people will want to raise children by the principles of libertarianism, not because they're libertarians and they agree with our worldview, and they're able to get past whatever psychological hang-ups they have from their traumatic childhood experiences that lead them to be statists, they're going to raise their children to be libertarian when they're so empowered that they go, well, this is the way to raise smart kids. This is simply how I raise children the way that, that I want them to turn out. And, oh crap, they turned out to be libertarian because we didn't beat them and we use reason and logic to appeal to them instead of arbitrary authority of do as I say, not as I do. So, thank you. I have been uh, following your talk for a little while now, maybe since you are you're on the RT. And I don't know that now you are you call yourself a capitalist or voluntarist, whatever. Okay. But uh, I feel like you made the last step quite recently. Am I right, or were you holding back? Oh, that's a that's a good question to put me on the spot. Sorry. No, I've been I've been an anarcho-capitalist voluntarist for a long time. But part of my process and my development as an independent media producer has been finding my voice, and speaking on these deeper and more meaningful topics as they become more meaningful to me. But I, I think I've always had that. I at, at least. At least in the, well of course, the non-aggression principle, even if I hadn't fully thought that out, even if I hadn't achieved the Zen that I've got today. So it's really not a matter, I, I was definitely not holding back. I, I, would hope, I would hope that you figured out by now that I don't do that. <laughs> I try to piss off every audience I speak to with at least something I say. <laughs> um, you were talking about the singularity issue, and um... <laughs> Um, I was wondering, because I know a lot of people are kind of like afraid when that happens that it'll be under someone else's control and that you'll, you won't be able to maintain your individual status and your, you know, power over yourself in a situation like that. So what do you think about that? So the question is when we get to a singularity, like uh, what if we still have government, right? Is that, what if, what if all of the technology that we're developing you know, that, that we're seeing freeing us and empowering us, what if it falls into the wrong hands? What if, um, you know, and, and again, that's where I have to say, well, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. Because I have, and, and I haven't had any evidence really to the contrary to this, but this is one of my fundamental beliefs. And I'd love it if anybody could challenge this. Technology is empowering. I've never, you know, even destructive technology, scientific progress, figuring out more shit from the hive mind, it's always empowering. Even if it's being used for bad in the short term, even if it's being used by evil government to do evil things, the long-term effect of technological advancement is empowerment of the individual. And 
You know, but like for example with the welfare state and, and peaceful parenting. We all want to be good parents to our children, right? I mean, everybody wants to raise children to be happy and prosperous and successful. And one of the things that we're coming to in terms of that exponential growth curve and productivity, that really applies to everything. And again, taking the long view really helps here. You go, in the state of nature, every human being had to work 16 hours a day, hunting and gathering, to survive. And now, the average American can support a family for their entire life by working from 22 to 65 for eight hours a day, five days a week with vacation time, and live at a higher standard of living than any of our ancestors could have possibly imagined. How are you gonna convince people that the welfare state is necessary when you can work for one year and have enough to support a family for the rest of your life? You know, and, and by the way, that status today of saying that the average American can work, you know, 22 to 65 and live a comfortable life, that's with the Federal Reserve sucking all the value out of the economy from that natural progression of the economy. You say the Fed is supposed to maintain price stability, that means they're supposed to fuck you out of technological progress that's supposed to drive prices down and increase your quality of life, and all of that value goes to the beneficiaries of the banking system. So I really have faith in technology being empowering, but especially because even if it all falls into the wrong hands in the short term, when we get to that point where everybody is so productive that they're able to, I mean, if you, if you can spend more time with your kids instead of working a nine to five, for the average human being who's not motivated by their work, but motivated by their family or things like that that are meaningful to them, they're gonna be a lot better parents. They're gonna read more parenting books. They're gonna realize like these simple facts about raising children that the more you appeal to logic and reason, the less you beat them, the more healthy they come out, the smarter, the more capable, and by the way, the more libertarian. Woo! I actually had a question about what your thoughts may be in terms of what's going on around the world with Europe and also all the currencies going down. It does seem to be a significant risk of a total meltdown, similar to 2008, but maybe just bigger in terms of that. What do you think might be the fallout of that and what might be a good strategy to sort of deal with that as a libertarian uh, that happens? The internet. <laughs> that's, no, that's a very good question. and it's you, know, you ask it in terms of Europe and the United States now and what we see in the currency crises that we are actually experiencing. And of course, these are all imagined, drummed up crises that give central banks the excuse to create more money. I think most people here would understand that. But what I see coming is that there is going to be a showdown as the currencies collapse, as the dollar starts to collapse. And it's funny to see now, I didn't, I'm not an expert on monetary policy, but seeing that the euro is going through premer, or, uh, premonitions of, of a collapse at, at a seemingly faster rate than anything that's happening here in the US. I mean, our debt got, or, you know, our rating got downgraded, credit rating of, uh, I said our credit, excuse me. I tell people all the time on my podcast, if I use collectivist language like that, you have to stop me. <laughs> the federal government's credit rating was downgraded from AAA to AA plus, and I don't know if, they, if it happened again. But what I see coming is a showdown between, you know, when, when the currencies collapse, when if it's the dollar or the euro, if it's a domino effect, who knows. But we still live in the global paradigm of status. And when the, you know, currencies start to collapse, people will, turn to the government for the answer. And more than ever though, instead of having that one source of information, having a government that controls the media and really can dominate the conversation, we have the internet. And I have a feeling that at that point, it's gonna be really important for us to do everything we can to frame the conversation, not between, well, do we go to the Amero or to the UN dollar? As rather, do we have fiat currency or do we have free market money? And I have so much faith in the internet and in our ability to use that, that even in the status paradigm today, I think a currency collapse would be the greatest challenge to statism itself, because when that happens and when people in the world are having that debate, the truth button that is right here, one click away on the internet, will show people that fiat currency is immoral and that the free market is superior. So there's a little midterm optimism for you. All right, so I just want to share a few things in closing here. 
I don't know if everybody heard about this, but in Middleborough, Massachusetts, <laughs> some people know what I'm talking about. In Middleborough, Massachusetts, they recently had a vote. Yes, they had a vote at a town hall meeting. And at this town hall meeting, there was a police officer who said, you know what? It's illegal in this town to curse. But the only thing we can do if we catch people cursing is put people in jail. And we don't really want to piss people off that much because that might threaten our protection racket. But what we really want is the ability to steal from people every time they curse. So would you please vote for us to be able to find everybody in this city of 20,000 and everybody who might just so happen to be wandering through our town. Could we find them? Could we just steal $20 from them if they curse? And there were about 236 people at that meeting and 183 voted yes. And in a town of 20,000, 183 have decided that it is punishable by theft of $20 from you if you utter an obscenity in public. So, <clears throat> the newspapers covering the story speculated that there might be a little bit of a fallout or blowback as a result of this policy. And I would be honored if you would join me in Middleborough, Massachusetts on Monday. I know a lot of you are driving home south from here. That's why we timed it this way. 12.30 in front of the town hall in Middleborough, Massachusetts. We are going to be having a free fucking speech demonstration. <laughs> It was something I thought of on a whim and was like, yeah, that would be fun on our way back from Porkfest. Next thing you know, we've got over 200 people attending the event on Facebook. But I gotta say, we're not there to disrupt the town. We're not going there to do any damage to the people of Middleborough who are victims of this violent gang, this small group of people that are imposing their will on everybody else but to simply call attention to this, to shine a spotlight on it, because I think it's really telling of the nature of government, this little story in, in, in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and it's not a small town, I mean 20,000, 183 people get to decide where the guns are pointed and why. It's pretty fucked up, but it really says something about the nature of government. So if you want to join us, Middleborough, Massachusetts on Monday, you can find it on Facebook, Free fucking speech demonstration. Quick question. Are we asking townspeople to join us? Well, I didn't think anybody was gonna join me. I was just like, I'll be out there with my bullhorn and I'll make a fun video. You know, really, that's all I was planning on doing. Now it's actually a legitimate protest. But I have seen from the Facebook page that there are a number of local Middleborough residents who are joining us who are excited about this. And there's one woman who is a reporter who covered this when the story went viral, who was like, I wrote these two stories. They went all over the nation. Everybody read them. I did it even before the vote. Nobody fucking showed up. <laughs> and I think, if anything, I, hope, I would hope that in, in this crowd of so many people who have... Um, at least put political action in perspective, if not sworn off of it entirely, that this really shows that there is a certain time when you can use political action to stop guns from being pointed at the wrong people. And simply showing up to a town hall meeting to vote, to say, no, please don't point guns at us because of words that we're speaking. I think there's a certain justification there that says, you have a certain responsibility in certain circumstances when you are presented with an opportunity through the process to be engaged. All right, super quick, because I just want to make an announcement and then wrap up, I'm at time. If the cops want to get 20 bucks, can't they just pull someone over? Right, this is an extra addition to their protection racket that actually has uh, an impetus from one of the store owners downtown saying, Children who are out of their government-run propaganda centers early in the afternoon are scaring away customers by cursing in the park. So, you know, we're going to gang up on the kids with this. And it's, it's a really bullshit law. I want to go early and interview a cop and be like, so, so what words would get me a fine? <laughs> what if I said fuck? 
How about shit? <laughs> and if I, if I get a ticket, then I can, you know, rip it up in his face on camera. We'll see. But anyways, I just had uh, two things I want to say real quick before I go. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we're having a very exciting panel. I know, it's Friday night at Corpus, and y'all thinking, yeah, I'm not fucking getting up at 9 a.m. You can go back to sleep. It's really hot in the tent at 9 a.m. here anyways. We're doing a panel on atheism and liberty with Ernie Hancock and Stefan Molyneux, and I just wanted to pitch that. Because... Maybe this is why they put us at 9 a.m. on Saturday. It's kind of a taboo topic, even here. Talking about the connection of atheism and liberty, and how it's important for so many people, and objectivism, and the process that people go through, shedding the mythologies of organized religion the same way that we often try to shed, as a, as a movement, the mythologies of statism. So I'll encourage you all to please, if you're up early and you'd like to wander down here, Stefan Molyneux and Ernie Hancock will be joining me. And right now, if anybody has further questions, I have to give up this space, but I like to be the last one to leave the room. In this case, I'm gonna be headed over to where we are selling Adam vs. the Man merchandise. Please help support my independent media effort operation. We're gonna be at the Freedoms Phoenix Dome in Agora Alley. Please support all the vendors. I'll see you in an hour for the roast. Thank you very much. Woo!